So let's try to transition from special relativity to general relativity. And we're going to do that using what's called Aaron Fess paradox, which involves uh, a rotating disk. And we're going to slightly change that here. Um, so here, let's imagine we have a fan. These are the spokes of a fan. And we're going to have this fan uh, rotate. So let's say that each of these uh, spokes is of length, say, L. And uh, near the end of the, each spoke, let's, uh, let's, place, let's place a green, uh, um, it could be a meter stick, uh, some measuring rod. Um, so it's a straight uh, rod. Uh, so it's very thin. Uh, and let's say that it's uh, smaller than L by a decent amount. So let's just say its length is D. So we'll have one right at the edge there. We'll have one right at the edge here. And so on for all of the spokes, but we're going to first imagine that uh, it's these, these um, little rods of length d are not attached to the spokes, and so as we rotate, that one's a little too thick, but you get the idea. We're going to start to rotate this rod sorry, this fan. So um, there are the little rods, and now let's uh, rotate the fan at a, an angular speed omega naught. Um, <clears throat> so the spokes trace out a path, and these rods that we're gonna use to infer the length of that path, they're just sitting there. Right, so from our perspective, they're just stationary. And so we want to figure out the length of this path. That's just a circumference of a circle of radius L. Right, so we can conclude that the circumference, the path traced out, well, uh, let's say, no, that's fine, 2 pi, so that's 2 pi L. Um, <clears throat> we can infer that from the fact that this is a circle, um, we haven't quite measured it, right? We sort of approximate that. We can imagine approximating that with these uh, rods. Now let's uh, change this slightly by imagining that uh, we, we managed to attach each of these green rods to the end of each spoke of the fan. And so now when we rotate the fan at angular speed omega naught, um, the green rods are going in a circle. Uh, but that means that each green rod has a speed, right? So when the rods are in motion, right, the speed uh, of each rod is just given by the angular um, of frequency omega times the length L. So it's omega naught times L. And that's the speed of each rod. And so um, we can think of, you know, so, so, so the thing is in motion. So we take a snapshot of this and this rod is moving with speed omega naught L that way. So it's part, for, for an instant, it's part of an inertial frame that's moving that way with speed omega naught L, right? This rod is for a moment in uh, an inertial frame that's moving that way with, uh, with speed omega naught L. And so, right, we have different inertial frames, and so we can sort of patch this together, but we have a a symmetry here, right? Each inertial frame um, is similar to all the others, 
Um, and so we can conclude that um, right, each Ra that's in a inertial frame moving with speed V has a length which is contracted. So the length of these rods is not D, uh, but uh, contracted by 1 minus V squared square root, and V is omega naught L, so omega naught squared L squared. And if we want to throw in the speed of light, we divide that by C squared, right? That's 1 minus V squared over C squared times D. So that's smaller than D. <coughs> and so, right, measuring the path traced out by each spoke um, in this way suggests to us that the path C is actually greater than 2 pi L because uh, we need more of these rods to cover the entire space because each one is shorter by that amount. Um, of course, this is not exact because uh, we're not actually measuring along the circumference. And the reason for that is that if we think of the points on the actual path, right, so here are two points on the actual path traced out by the, the spokes, these two points belong to separate inertial frames or instantaneous inertial frames and so they cannot be connected by special relativity and we can't and we can't apply this we're sort of patching this together we're sort of inferring this um, so what we seem to be finding is that in accelerating frames, so in fact these are many different accelerated frames, which we're sort of patching together given the high symmetry, uh, space is not Euclidean. So when we have acceleration, we seem to be concluding that space is not Euclidean, and so it's not really a paradox, it's just in an accelerated frame, we have this conclusion. And of course, we know that space and time are subject to constraints. And so if we say that acceleration, that in, a, in an accelerated frame, space is not Euclidean, or space is curved, then we're going to conclude that in an accelerated frame, it's space and time that are curved. And then we're going to look at the principle of equivalence. Which will uh, suggest to us that there's something very similar about an accelerated frame and a frame in which um, there's gravity, and that equivalence will then allow us to transfer this conclusion and to get to general relativity, where we say that um, gravity is space-time curvature.